and welcome to This Is What Came Out Of Me, a series about anything and everything, but mostly movies, TV, podcasts, and YouTube. In each episode, I talk about things that have grabbed my interest, and things that I think that you out there in the big wide world might be interested in. I'm Sierra Kilo Bravo, let's get into it. I've got two book reviews for you today. First up, we've got a sci-fi fantasy set in the year 2044, and then one about a real-life event about 100 years earlier in World War II. Let's kick off with the fiction one. You've probably heard of a new Steven Spielberg movie coming out soon called Ready Player One. Well, in case you didn't know, it's based on a book of the same name by Ernest Cline, which was released in 2011. With the movie coming up, both Casey Neistat and Philip DeFranco on YouTube have mentioned the book as part of their book clubs, so I decided to check it out. So, what's it about? Well, here is the synopsis. In the year 2044... The world has been gripped by an energy crisis from the depletion of fossil fuels and the consequences of global warming, causing widespread social problems and economic stagnation. To escape the decline their world is facing, people turn to the Oasis, a virtual reality simulator accessible by players using visors and haptic technology such as gloves. It functions both as a massive multiplayer online role-playing game and as a virtual society, with its currency being the most stable in the real world. It was created by James Halliday, who, when he died, had announced in his will to the public that he had left an Easter egg inside the Oasis, and the first person to find it would inherit his entire fortune and the corporation. The story follows the adventures of Wade Watts, starting about five years after the announcement, when he discovers one of the three keys pointing to the treasure. Now, first up, be warned, there will be spoilers for the book ahead, so if you don't want to have anything spoiled, skip to here to move to the next part of the episode. So it's quite a unique setup, as the synopsis reveals. I don't recall anything quite like this, with maybe the closest being that old movie, The Last Starfighter. It's an enjoyable book, but it's not much more than light summertime poolside reading, in my opinion, and there's a few weird and incongruous things about it. For example, it reads a bit like a young adult novel, The main characters are young and have young people problems. It's the classic teens fighting an evil corporation in a dystopian future type story at its core. But if this is the target demographic, then anyone who's currently a teen would be unlikely to understand all of the 1980s references. Currently, the oldest teenagers would have been born around 10 years after all those references took place and would have never lived through having these things as new and exciting parts of their life or their childhoods growing up. At most, they would know about them only if they were really into movies and video games and were into deep diving back catalogues. Something not very likely in my opinion. And so, if young adults are not the target demographic, and people who did live through those times and experience these games and movies as part of growing up, I'm not sure they would be able to relate to the young person angst and awkwardness present in a good part of the book. I can speak from experience in this regard, as I was a kid growing up in the 1980s, and while I wasn't so much into video games, I grew up watching the three Star Wars movies, the three Indiana Jones movies, the Back to the Future trilogy, in short, I grew up loving movies, and many of the movies that are mentioned and featured in the book, and while all this helped with all of those references, I found myself thinking several times that I was reading a young adult novel. So, like I say, for me, it was a book that sits weirdly across genres, and I'm not so sure that that works all of the time. So, let me get to the thing that bothered me the most, and that is the just plain terribly written dialogue and prose. 
Oh, in some parts, it's just so, so bad. Like high school English assignment bad. Like distracting you from the story bad. Like it makes the awkward fence-sitting genre not seem so bad bad. In some parts, Klein will go into a weird amount of detail about something, and then in other parts, he'll be like, and somehow I got through that part of the game. It's all over too fast in some parts. There's certain there's a certain amount of inconsistency throughout the book and the narration. Tie this in with weak and stereotypical characters, and you'll start to get a sense of why this book just didn't gel in my head. A special bugbear of mine was the characterization of Shoto and Daito, two fellow hunters who are Japanese. It's like Klein was trying to jam in every Japanese stereotype imaginable on these two. An example of this was how they kept talking about honor. Hey Klein, Japanese people don't talk like that. And then there were things that were just flat out incorrect. At one point, there's a bit that reads as follows. When Shoto saw that I'd finished reading, he closed the window. I hesitated a moment before asking, are you sure he didn't really commit suicide because his avatar had been killed? No, Shoto said. Daito did not commit seppuku. I am sure of it. Honestly, Klein, dude, this is so Utterly and completely wrong, seppuku does not refer to suicide in general, but to a specific ritualistic act where somebody cuts their belly open. Honestly, 10 seconds on Google would have told you that the word is jisatsu. Another thing that bothered me, and it's something that bothers me in a lot of books and movies, is that the main character is a bit of a Mary Sue, or Gary Sue, I guess, since he's a male. In other words, he seems to have all the skills needed to get something accomplished, despite being described as just a normal, average, everyday dude. He seems to be able to do whatever it is that is required at any given moment. For example, if he's not allowed to listen to music while he works, well, he just hacks his visor to allow it, and things like this. It's just all a bit too convenient at times. And this even extends to his knowledge of the 1980s. He tells us that he's seen the movie War Games three dozen times, Blade Runner more than four dozen, and Monty Python and the Holy Grail 157 times. In other parts of the book, we're subjected to extended passages detailing movie franchises to which he's devoted scrupulous attention to detail. Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Firefly, which I'm pretty sure didn't happen in the 80s, but you name it, and he has seen it and watched them enough to be an absolute expert on them. He can quote every line and knows every step of these movies. And not just movies, but also TV shows. He reels off a number of TV shows that he has seen all existing seasons of. Not just once, but again, to the point where he is intimately familiar with all the tiny details of them. Not to mention all the hundreds of video games that he's played. Not just to a level where he's familiar with them, but to have beaten them and mastered them. Now, I haven't done the maths, but I'm highly sceptical that such obsessive research could have been carried out in the five years since the announcement and the commencement of the contest. I'm pretty sure there would not be enough time to do all those things once, let alone enough times to be a master of all of them. Certainly not to the extent of knowledge that Wade has in the story. It was just another case of me saying, oh yeah, right, as I made my way through the book. And something else that made me roll my eyes was the numerous plot conveniences. Like when Wade needs to get to a planet's surface undetected, he just pulls out a ring of teleportation that he just happened to pick up after slaying a dragon a while back. This kind of thing happens again and again, and it just smacks of lazy writing. It got to the point where Wade would say something like, I was not sure how I was going to make it through this section of the game, 
And internally, I was like, something tells me you'll be fine, mate. Look, I know I'm ragging on this pretty hard, but it was it was a likable enough read. It is a page turner. I burned through it in about a week. But this might also be an indicator of how shallow it is. And for the nostalgia points that I understood, it was cool to remember what life was like in the 1980s. It was definitely a different time. So overall, I don't know if I can recommend this as a serious, deep and life-changing kind of read, but if you've got some travel coming up and you want something light to help you pass the time, then this would fit into that requirement nicely. It will be interesting to see what they do with this as a movie. Klein also wrote the screenplay adaptation, so he's been heavily involved in this, so it will indeed be interesting to see what they do. From my view, though, so far, the trailer looks like CGI, the movie. Now let's have a look at the World War II book. Some time ago, I mentioned a podcast called The John Batchelor Show, and a book John reviewed called Target Tokyo, Jimmy Doolittle and the Raid that Avenged Pearl Harbor by James M. Scott. After hearing about it, and as a bit of an airplane and World War nerd, I was keen to read it. Fortunately, my local library had a copy, and after getting my hands on it, I devoured it. All 600 pages of it. I thoroughly enjoyed it and would rank it as one of the best World War II books I've ever read. So, what's it all about? Well, as the title suggests, after the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, a payback mission was planned with a famous pilot by the name of Jimmy Doolittle leading it. It was a very high-risk mission for a number of reasons, the main two being that it required putting the remnants of a depleted fleet within a few hundred miles of Japan, and that in order for the mission to make an impact, it required bombers to be launched from those ships. What makes it so good is the detail. Scott goes deep on a lot of things, but has a knack of never making it boring, Whether it's the backstory of Jimmy Doolittle or the situation in China when Japan invaded it, there's a huge amount of detail, but it's all relevant. Scott has found a really good balance in giving you what you need to know to give you a complete picture, but not burying you in useless information. As the mission unfolds, Scott deftly handles tracking the 16 planes and the 80 crew involved. They all ended up in different places after the attack from China to Russia, and you're taken to each place in turn to find out where the various crews are up to. Move on to the next crew, and around a few times as their stories progress. The effect of this is to have several cliffhangers throughout the book, which keeps you engaged and turning pages. It's very, very well done. And I even learned something new. It was really interesting in a part toward the end of the book, they spoke about these guys that were dropped into areas where prisoner of war camps were to count the prisoners, check their health and render assistance. Now these guys were dropping into places where they could not be sure that word had reached that the war was over. I've never heard of this before, and those guys must have had some big brass balls to drop into these highly hostile areas in order to help the POWs. I really would like to learn a bit more about this, and if anyone happens to know of any books about this, I would really like to learn what their names are so that I can check them out. So, in a nutshell, I really loved this book, and if you have any kind of interest in World War II or the military, then I very, very much recommend this to you. You should definitely check it out. So that's all for today. Just two book reviews, Ready Player One and Target Tokyo. That's all for this time. I hope you enjoyed it. Check the notes for links to the books that I've covered today. Until next time, be excellent to each other. I'm Sierra Kilo Bravo, and this is what came out of me.